Uh, the next speaker is uh, going to talk to us about post-release salmon mortality, Dr. Katrina Cook. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming and for engaging in these conversations. Um, thank you for the BC Wildlife Federation for putting this on. Um, my name's Katrina. I work, I'm a scientist with in-stream fisheries research in Squamish. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of my PhD research that I did at UBC though. And with my research I aim to understand release mortality in Pacific salmon, try to understand some of the factors associated with mortality, and examine ways in which we can reduce mortality. And I primarily worked with purseine fisheries. So this was a huge effort, lots of organizations were involved, but I do want to point out that um, I'm also presenting data that was led by Art Bass. He was a fellow PhD student. We were both supervised by Scott Hinch, and I'm also going to be presenting uh, a report, some data led by David Patterson with Fisheries and Oceans. Um, and lots of people to thank here, lots of organizations involved, but I do especially want to thank the Shushwap Band, the Peters Band, the Gitgat, Nish Nishka, and Kwantlen First Nations for allowing this work to proceed on their traditional territories. I also want to thank all the fishermen involved, all the captains and crew that brought us on board. It's not easy having a scientist on your vessel, so I really appreciate that they were so welcoming and accommodating and understanding of what we were trying to do. So I don't need to go through this in a lot of detail for this audience, but especially in these large coastal fisheries, they're not selective. Multiple species and populations will co-migrate along the coast and the nets capture this, this diversity of fish. And in most of these fisheries, the non-target species are released. And throughout this talk, I'm going to be um, talking about these, these fish that are released, but also in the context of the CSAS report that was uh, published in, in 2017. So I'll be referring a lot to FRIM, which stands for Fishing Related Incidental Mortality. And the CSAS is the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat. So this was led by David Patterson, and it was the result of a DFO management request for scientific advice on FRIM. And the management problem was that a variable and uncertain portion of non-retained fish die during and after a fishery encounter. And this is a problem for management because they need to account for FRIM in stock assessment models and, in fishery, and for fishery management. And what management really want to effectively manage these fisheries are fair and transparent estimates of FRIM for each fishery. But if you look at each fishery and each species and each location, you may end up with thousands of combinations and it's really impractical to come up with a mortality estimate for each one of these combinations. So we need to start looking bigger picture about some of the factors that underlie mortality and not just rely on these pure percentages. So I'm dividing my talk into two components. The first is the fish component. Um, I'm going to be throwing out some fish mortality estimates, those percentages that I told you we need to look beyond. I'll be talking a lot about those. Um, then going into some of the factors associated with mortality. And then the human component, which is often overlooked but is exceptionally important. So I'll be talking about some handling recommendations and perceptions from the fishing community. And I worked with lots of different fisheries here, several different species, so just a note on how to follow along and not to get lost with what I'm talking about. I'll be mentioning either beach seine fisheries, gill nets, purseines, and I worked with three different species, coho, sockeye, and chum. And in the top right corner, I'll have a photo of the fishery I'm talking about and the species I'm talking about. So you can, um, if I forget to mention it, you can stay on track. So I have mortality estimates from two species and many different populations, um, two coastal purseine fisheries and two years of beach sand and gillnet comparative studies in the Fraser River. The first study was in the Juan de Fuca off the west coast of Vancouver Island and here we are focused on interior Fraser River coho but we tagged several populations of coho um, and these were released from a purseine and the objective was to update the mortality estimate for that fishery. I did a similar study with sockeye in the NAS in area three. So these fish were tagged in Portland Inlet just at the mouth of the NAS. And again, this was to update a mortality estimate for this fishery. In the Fraser River, and this is work led by Art Bass, um, 
Here, he tagged fish at multiple in-river locations. In 2014, he was targeting late-run Shushuap sake and looking at mortality of beach sane relative to, um, to gillnet captured fish. He repeated this study in 2015, so again, this is Art's PhD research. Here, he tagged fish um, in the lower Fraser, just at the Peters Road location. The focus here was on mixed summer run populations, and again, this beach sane gillnet comparative study. And then, because chum are my favorite, um, I'll also be talking about some chum work I did on the, on the central coast, or the north, north central coast. Um, so, to start with the coho, so um, fish were tagged just off of Port Renfrew right here where all the asterisks is there. I don't know if you can see all the different uh, icons I have in there. The dotted lines represent expected migration pathways for the tagged fish. You can see some went down into the Puget, oops, some went down into the Puget Sound and some went in the Fraser River and some went north. Um, and then all the other dots are receiver locations. So I've already skipped ahead there, but I have survival estimates to different lines of detection. So from release to the first line of detection, which is this line across Juan de Fuca here, survival was 65%. It drops as you go along. So to the San Juan Islands, survival was 46.8%. And then to the entrance of the Fraser River, and this is for Fraser River only fish, survival was 32%. And there were a few fisheries happening throughout the Juan de Fuca this year, so we can, we're pretty certain that the mortality we see in the study was due to either the, the fishery encounter itself or natural mortality. Um, so these, and we're seeing pretty low survival to the Fraser River, less than 35%. Um, that, those are pretty concerning rates. So for the NAS, here we tagged fish um, right at the mouth here because we are really trying to capture NAS sockeye and not skeena sockeye. So there's a limited coastal approach here, and they are detected at these in-river locations um, uh, as identified by those triangles. And this year, there was no in-river fisheries. So we saw lower short-term mortality, less than 25% to the first point of detection, but again, that distance isn't very long there. Um, and to Mesiadin, uh, again, we're seeing this l more concerning long-term estimate of mortality of, of um, greater than 50% to Mesiadin Lake. And I'll spend a bit more time on this one. It's a little more complicated. This is Art's work from the Fraser. So here we have the three tagging locations, which are the circles, and receiver locations are the squares. But I'm only going to talk, so he did full survival anal analyses, and I actually have some of these papers printed out if people are interested in the, the real numbers here. I'm just going to talk about uh, survival to the terminal receivers. So he tagged fish at McMillan Island, at Peters Road, at Savannah, and there's Shushwap Lake there. These are where the terminal receivers were. So three locations, two gear types at each location, and comparing be Beach Seine and Gillnet. So from McMillan Island um, to the terminal receivers, Survival for beach sane fish was 71%, and for gillnet fish, 35%, so about half. From the next location up, Peters Road, um, slightly better survival rates and less of a difference between gear types, 62% for beach sane, 46% for gillnet. And then some Savannah to terminal receivers, higher again, 82% for beach sane and 75% for gillnet. So that's just the range there, dependent on location. So the take home here is that beach sand consistently results in higher survival, but the differences between the two gear types decreases with increasing distance along the river upstream. So then he repeated this again in 2015, and here the target was a mix of summer run populations. So there's Chilco, Nadina, Stilaco fish, and he only tagged fish at Peters Road in this one lower river location and then receivers went up to the Chilcotin. And this year he saw very low survival. So from tagging at Peters Road to detection in the Chilcotin receiver, it was 9% for beach sane fish and 2% for gillnet fish. So with the same tagging location and capture methods, we saw much lower survival than in 2014. So the obvious question is, is why? Well, there are a few things happening. These are totally different populations. Temperature was a lot higher this year, and there were more in-river fisheries occurring. But what I really want to drive home from all of these numbers is that they're variable. 
Mortality estimates are really informative for specific feature, fisheries, species, locations. It's, it's so context dependent, or for gear type comparisons, but within so much each fishery, you get huge variations. And this is where the frim framework, the CSAS document, really comes into play. So we need to start looking at the fish response and all of the things that play into this fish response. So we call this the fish-centric approach. Um, so we have to look at the fishing factors, so the gear, the handling method, if recovery treatments used, the catch composition and crowding and things like that. And then each of these components also has an aspect of duration with it. We have to look at extrinsic factors, things like temperature, water quality, salinity, uh, any predators that are around. We have to consider intrinsic factors such as the precondition of the fish, maybe the fish was sick before we captured it, or maturity and sex and population. And then also there's different levels of fish fate. There's immediate mortality, there's latent mortality, there's dropout mortality, um, there's sublethal effects, there's um, a variety of things we can look at in terms of fish fate as well. So in all of the work we've done over the past few years looking at post-release mortality, what factors have we found that are associated with FRIM? Well, in the COHO study that I did in the Juan de Fuca, we saw large survival differences among populations, and that was the strongest predictor of success, was population. And the biggest difference was between interior Fraser River fish and lower Fraser River fish, and this is COHO here. So the graph is showing survival um, from release here, um, to the point of last detection, which was within the lower Fraser. And there's different population groupings here, but the two I want to point out are lower Fraser, so from release to last detection, lower Fraser river fish had 14% survival, and interior Fraser river fish tagged within days of each other, or like within this three-day period, um, same migration pathway to that point, and they had 48% survival. So huge differences with population here. Another predictor of mortality in the study, or predictor of survival, um, was level of injury. And I recorded lots of types of injury, fin fray, scale loss, any wounds, and scale loss consistently came out as the most important. And remember, these are ocean caught coho, so that's an important part. And I did a short holding study on board as well, and I found that injury actually differed by population as well. So, oops, oh, how do I go back? You shouldn't be seeing this yet. There. <laughs> um, uh, injury in the interior Fraser River fish. So this is a semi-quantitative injury score that just scores observations of injury. Um, injury with lower interior Fraser fish than in lower Fraser River fish. Okay, now you can see the sockeye. And this is work also arts, some of Art's work. Um, he handled fish at the Seton Dam and then tracked them to spawning. And he had a different way of, a, of recording injury. Here he looked at um, the severity of net marks and he classified them as zero to three with zeros no net marks and three is the most severe net marks. So you, it's not just injury but it's also the severity of injury. So what he found was um, for no to moderate injury, sorry, survival was over 80%, so that's these lines up here. Um, but then when you look at net scores of three, which is shown in this figure, you can see survival drops off quite a bit, and th this isn't over a very large distance either. It's about 40 kilometers there. So we're seeing poor survival with severe injury, and I mean, that's pretty intuitive, but that's a, quite a striking difference of, uh, across these course classifi classifications. Maturity was something that was also quite, came out as quite important. This is work I did with chum. I did these chum holding studies where I held them for five to 10 days. This is five day data. And these are the injury scores, the same semi-quantitative injury score at day zero and at day five and different classifications of injury. So there's mature, silver, which is the least mature, and then silver bright, which is somewhere in between. And what you can see is that injury progressed over the five days in all fish, but it pro progressed faster in less mature fish, and females overall, both at day zero and day five, had higher injury scores. So females are more susceptible to injury. And I don't show any of this data here today, but we're, we find that females typically have higher mortality rates as well. <laughs> 
And I think Ark's work does a really good job of exemplifying how complex these relationships are and how, how many interacting factors are at play. So this is results from the survival analyses he did um, for fish tagged at McMillan Island in 2014. So here is uh, tagging at McMillan Island and then survival to last detection in um, just downstream of Shuswap Lake. And you have black is females and red is males. And the triangles, I hope you can see them, are beach seine. Sorry, the circles are beach seine and the, and the triangles are gillnet. And you can see here that fate differs by sex, where females have higher mortality, and gear type, where gillnet has higher mortality. So this female gillnet is this line down here. But then that same year, at the next tagging location up, so not too far upstream, you lose that effect. And there is actually no significant effect of either sex or gear type in this year. Um, so it changes with just that small difference in distance. So these sex and gear type effects aren't as clear, not too far upstream. The next year, he went to the same tagging location, Peters Road. So again, this is a different population where we saw the really low, uh, low survival. Um, again, these differences with gear type come out where, uh, oh, um, beach sand, or gill netted fish have lower survival. So we have multiple confounding factors here and multiple things we have to consider for each mortality estimate. There's differences with gear type because there's one factor of this is that there's differences in injury sustained with different gear types. There's differences with location. Different populations may be captured at different locations. Temperatures may differ at different locations which can have a, a strong effect on probability of survival. Um, maturity levels. Um, Fish of different maturity levels are more susceptible to injury, and populations may mature at different times at each capture location. There's the sex effect, effect, and females seem to be more vulnerable to the injury. They mature at different levels, and, and females are also more uh, vulnerable to the effects of temperature. And then there's year effects as well, which also play into temperature and population. And this network that I put up here, these are just the factors that we've evaluated. There's lots more things going on that we haven't measured or haven't um, statistically evaluated their effect on mortality. And these complexities really highlight the importance of having this FRIM framework and this way of evaluating all the factors that, that could be having an effect that we're not monitoring. So this is the whole from framework taken together. I thought it would be too much to put it on all at once, but now I've added all the little boxes. Um, so we have fishing factors going into the fish response, extrinsic factors, intrinsic, fact, intrinsic fa factors, all of the different fate outcomes, so dropout, latent mortality, immediate mortality, sublethal effects. And for each fishery, you can look at this whole fish experience and these factors evaluate, or, that influence fish experience and come out with a mortality component. And then taking all this together is what you need to consider when considering the range of mortality estimates. So just to revisit the outline here, that's all I want to talk about the fish component. And I'll just move on to the human component now. So these factors and this fish-centric approach are really important for making management decisions. You can make, for example, there could be closures when there's high water temperatures or the fishery can manage to avoid vulnerable port populations or populations at vulnerable stages. Um, but what about the human component? Maybe we could improve fish experience uh, through changes to handling and sorting and that's a more tenable thing that we can change. So to determine these handling recommendations and evaluate the effects of different levels of handling, I conducted onboard sampling. So that's me on a person taking a blood sample there on the left. And then I did holding studies to monitor changes in condition over time. So this is some of our chum holding studies. Here's a, a field assistant measuring the external condition of a chum. And just a note on how these studies are done. Um, a lot of these fisheries happen in really remote areas, and one of the reasons we don't have much data on them is because it's so logistically challenging to get out there and work on them and be on these boats. 
So to do the study on the Central Coast, I actually lived on this dock for a month with three other field assistants, and we'd go out on the boats and then bring some chum back and hold them, and we just held them there for 10 days and watched over them, and it, you know, it's spectacularly beautiful, but it's really difficult to get good quality data just because it's so remote. So one of the handling, or the aspects of how the gear is handling I want to look at is how they're held in the net or how long they're held in the net. And how I did that is, and I mean like in the net, along, pursed alongside the boat. This is in a purse scene. So on the x-axis here, I have time pursed in the net. And each point is a blood sample that I took. So each point is an individual that I blood sampled. And I fit what's called spline regressions to this, da to this data. And some people call these hockey stick graphs. But instead of looking at linear relationships, you want to look at the breaking point between the physiological response or the magnitude of stress perceived and time to see like, where the threshold is, at what point is a fish at maximal stress or can no longer respond. So this one graph I'm showing here is for glucose, which is a secondary stress indicator. And it shows this breaking point at about 15 minutes. But then if you look at other stress indicators, um, lactate and chloride, they all show this threshold at 15 minutes. So what this indicates is that if, if boats could complete their sorting and have all the fish overboard and released and the ones they want to harvest, harvest within 15 minutes, then perhaps we could improve fish experience and reduce the amount of stress experienced. I also looked at air exposure, so that's the amount of time fish are on the deck on the sorting table being sorted. And for this, because air exposure has more neurological effects in addition to stress, I looked at impairment, which is a measure of the ability to respond to any kind of stimuli. So I looked at the presence of reflexes. And I had different classifications of air exposure, so no air exposure, one to two minutes, two to three, and three to four. And it's pretty obvious here, you see a big increase in impairment, so a failure to respond to reflexes um, after two minutes. And we know from other telemetry study we've done, mostly in the Fraser River, that after an impairment score of 0.4, you really expect, you expect to see high mortality. And I will point out that this work was done with chum, which are quite resilient compared to other, or anecdotally thought to be quite resilient compared to other species, so just keep that in mind. But the recommendation for chum, at least, is to keep air exposure below two minutes, and ideally below one minute, to reduce the effects of capture. Um, so just to go in now with some, uh, into some perceptions from the fishing community on all of this work I've done. This is brought, and brought up a bit today, but these mortality estimates, they rarely consider compliance. Um, Scientists, you know, I'm a scientist too, we like to look at things that we can measure, um, temperature, things like that. Whereas compliance, it's, it's this wild card that we don't really know what effect it has or have any way to measure it really. And we know that from lots of natural resource management that support from the fishing community is essential for any successful conservation initiative. So if we want to come up with recommendations, I threw out some really specific ones there, we know they won't be adopted unless they have support among the fishing community. So I went out and talked to the fishing community. Um, I did a social science study focused on the purse seine fisher, or fleet. I interviewed commercial purse seine skippers and crew about their perceptions of what what I was doing in these recommendations and of selective fishing in general. And the first part of this is to understand problem perception. If there's no problem perceived in the first place, it's really hard to um, incentivize change. So I first asked, do fish survive to spawning? And most participants, 76% of them, believe survival to be high. And I defined high as over 70% in this study. So one participant said, all of them survive. That's why I think, otherwise I wouldn't do it, suggesting they wouldn't throw them overboard. So I asked, is there a need for standardized handling procedures? And most of the study participants said um, they believed it would be unnecessary, ineffective, or already exist. Um, so this really paints a picture of the, there not being much of a perception of a problem of high mortality of released fish among the fishing community. 
So then I asked some questions about management to see where the problems might lie. Um, so I asked, when making management decisions, does the DFO primarily consider industry, conservation, public opinion, or I gave them another option as well. And most participants, 53%, believe public opinion. And where conservation was stated as the primary goal, 35%, um, they said their goals weren't being achieved. Um, and DFO's stated mandate is conservation. So this paints a really concerning picture, and it shows where the distrust lies and where the problem perception lies. One participant said, none of it makes sense. Decisions aren't made in the best interest of anybody or anything. That's exceptionally negative. Um, but I think it, it really highlights where the problem is. And this is a sentiment that we really have to pay attention to, and we can't just push under the rug. So I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the, ne the interviews were quite negative. Um, but I like to end the interviews by asking, OK, so maybe you don't think mortality is high on your boat. Um, if you could change any one thing to improve survival, what would that be? What single change would be most effective? And in the context of also being practical for the vessel and the, and the crew. And almost the most popular answer was infrastructural changes. So currently, it's a conditions of license to use a sorting table. Like, like that in that photo, but not all the boats do. Some still sort on deck. Um, and some of the boats have voluntarily installed these release chutes. Um, and even the boats that use the release chutes really thought this really worked. It was easier on the crew and better for the fish. Um, but even the boats that didn't said they would be open to it and think that that would be a good way to improve survival of released fish. This is my favorite quote. Um, one participant said, the chute on this boat works like a hot dam. They would save a lot more fish if everybody had chutes. So this is a really positive thing that came out of this. It's something that we could change that may be accepted by the fishing community. Other changes that brought, were brought up was improved communication and feedback. There was lots of concerns raised about if selective fishing was working in the first place, why are we throwing fish back if we don't know if they survive or if there isn't any data to show that it's actually being effective. And a lot of participants brought up enforcement, which I, I don't really want to touch, touch on today, but where they said more enforcement, they'd like it to be different. So I'm just going to take a few minutes here to summarize some of my main points. So short-term survival can be high for purse-sane fisheries, at least. Um, and DFO does use these 24-hour mortality estimates, but the numbers, when you look over the long term, beyond the first 24 hours, are concerning and be, can be quite high. Um, so we had 45% survival to Mesiadin and Nass Sockeye tagged at river entry, 14 to 48% survival depended on population to the lower Fraser and Coho tagged offshore in area 20, and a huge variability depended on gear and location, 2 to 82% survival in Sockeye to the spawning grounds tagged from the lower Fraser. And these long-term impacts are potentially not considered. Gillnet capture tends to lead to higher mortality and injury compared to beach sand, but these differences are reduced closer to spawning grounds, particularly with injury as fish mature, their skin toughens up. Estimates of release mortality, sorry, are very context dependent. You have to consider the fishery area, species, population, maturity, sex, I could list many, many things here. Um, but the FRIM framework really acknowledges this variability. So the FRIM framework aims to consider fish experience and use all available information to come up with the range of mortality estimates. And there's two research documents that are publicly available on DFO's website. Research document A is the factor analysis. So this is the one that takes all of the available information and is essentially a review paper. And research document B comes up, um, provides guidance for how to establish mortality estimates. And both of these documents are quite lengthy. They're excellent reads, but they are long. Um, and this SAR document pr provides the official communication piece, and it's a little more digestible. I have some of them printed out if someone would like one, or they're available online as well. So in terms of improving survival, reducing injury among released fish would improve probability of survival. And this extends to various types of injury. 
Um, intuitive leaf scale loss was most important in the marine environment, and gillnet wounds or more open wounds were more um, important in river and closer to the spawning grounds. With increasing maturity, fish have a lower probability of sustaining injuries and a higher survival probability. And we developed these evidence-based handling recommendations for Persane that air exposure should be kept below two minutes and ideally below one minute, and fish should be sorted within 15 minutes. And the methods that we used to come up with these recommendations, it wasn't that um, exhausting of a process, and these could be applied to other fisheries that, that employ release measures. And in the interviews, there is a willingness among the fishing community to improve handling. There was a strong conservation ethic. No commercial fisherman wants to catch the last fish. They do want to see a future in their livelihoods, but they do perceive survival to be high. And that lack of problem perception, combined with the distrust in management and of the, uh, the intent of the regulations in the first place, does introduce difficulties. But the release shoots was something that was suggested by the fishing community as an, a potential way to improve survival of these released fish. And so maybe that's something we should be looking to as an attainable means to um, move forward. And that's all I have. So I think I have some time for questions if anybody has one. Thanks for listening. Pretty interesting stuff. A uh, couple of questions. So you're out there doing your experimental sets with the scenery. Mm -hmm. How many sets a day did you make? We were running experimental fish on the purse things. We were running experimental fisheries um, and often transporting fish to the holding pens as well. So we would only do four sets a day. Yeah, that's that's a reflection of my experience as well. When we were trying to find steelhead for radio tagging offshore for its rupert. We yeah. had to cut it down to five sets a day to yeah. be able to sort through the catch and safely handle the fish so we could pick out the steel and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. A normal sane fishery was 20 sets a day. Yeah, but I mean, part of the reason why we had so few sets is because I was taking blood samples from each individual and then processing them. Like, there are lots of other experimental things that were happening on board that were limiting our abilities to move quickly. But I, I, I see your point that in an actual opening, they're moving quickly and, and handling and it's more about getting the number of sets in than... Right, and, and then that, that brings up the other question. So you were always out there as an individual vessel. You never had the experience of fishing during an opening when it was what I like to call the gauntlet fishery, where you've got, you know, you have to look in any direction, you're just yeah. surrounded by boats that are going to catch the fish, you just let go? I No, we weren't. Um, I have been on those fisheries. Um, I mean, the... <laughs> The realistic thing is that you can't be, it's very difficult to be on board an active fishing vessel as a scientist tagging fish just because of this time aspect. They would need to be compensated for the extra time of, that we No, I, I fully fish. appreciate yeah. that. The <laughs> point is that I think that, you know, when, when we translate the, uh, the sort of experimental results to a fleet situation. Absolutely. I know, and that's why. That's another reason why we can only take so much out of these percentages that I'm, I'm presenting. You know, there, there's lots of other things happening. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, great presentation and obviously some good science there. Um, you noted that you did different sets um, up the Fraser and into the Shuswap system. Were the hang times or the net times basically the same on those because you noted that there were a, a higher or a, a less differential between the gill net and the, the sane fisheries as you moved up river? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if the hang times for the, the nets were the same at each location. And then also, um, uh, were you able to track any of the cause of death, the actual cause of death, other than knowing that those fish didn't reach their uh, spawning beds? To answer the first question, well, I, don't, I can't really answer the first question because it wasn't my research that I was leading, it was a colleague. Um, but I'm fairly certain that the hang times were similar among capture locations. I don't know how reflective they were of an actual fishery. I think the, the nets weren't in the water quite as long as they would be for an actual opening, but I think there was consistency among the locations from more of an experimental point of view. Um, 
And then what with your second the, question? Were you able to actually determine any cause of oh. death? Was it fungus? Was it uh, pathogens? Was no. it from injury? Um, when you tag a fish and then release it, the chances of finding that fish again is really, really hard. And then assigning an exact cause of death to that one fish when you find it is, is nearly impossible, really. So the data was really that they, they didn't reach their spawning they, Yeah, area. they weren't detected by the receivers anymore. So the actual cause of death is, is unknown. We just know that they didn't make it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, na naive question probably, but yeah. um, the natural mortality of a fish, say, I think it was a coho tagged in southwestern Vancouver and then recovered somewhere in the Fraser or something, presumably mm -hmm. would be just a triveling, at that stage would be a triveling percentage of the total because you're measuring the manipulation tagging yeah. and, and natural mortality, but yeah. natural mortality would be a trivial fraction of that. Is that correct? I don't know. I, we don't, but there's no real way to measure natural mortality because you can't measure mortality unless you tag the fish and you can't attribute, you can't proportionalize what part of that mortality is due to the tagging and handling and capture and what... Yeah, that's what I wondered. Yeah, what but isn't. If, if, that, if, if, if smolts were tagged and then some of those were... were tagged as adults later, you might be able to get, I don't know if that, those kind of data exist. I'm not suggesting you, you guys do that. But. Um, well, I think that's more, I mean, David Welch might be a better person, person to answer yeah, that I, question. I but um, <laughs> when you tag juveniles, the tag, you have to use really small tags that don't have much battery life, like maybe 30 days. Um, so you wouldn't detect that fish returning as an adult. Yeah, hi, Katrina. That's hi. Uh, Carl. Uh, when you did the NAS study, did you do DNA on the uh, yeah, sockeye? Yeah, we did. So that's, um, I think I've already shared that data with LGL. But <laughs> um, that's, so that's removing the, the Skeena sockeye from that. That was just NAS sockeye. Oh, but the, within the NAS stocks, because you're talking Mesiadin is only a portion of the NAS populations. And yeah. A lot of them spawning below Mesiadin mm -hmm. in the last number of years. So just getting 45% to Mesiadin is not unexpected. Right. Um, I don't know if I can answer that question, actually. Um, Andrea Reed was leading, has that data right yeah. now, and she hasn't done a full survival analysis on it yet. Um, so I, don't, I can't actually speak to that. But we do have that data, and yeah. we will be refining those mortality estimates. Yeah, it'd be good to do that. On, on the issue of locations where fish die and en route, mm -hmm. Uh, we were trying to tackle that question on the Fraser quite distinctly yeah. of a number of years when we were doing the studies with the Salmon Commission. And we couldn't identify the locations where you, when you have a lot of receivers spread out over the entire watershed where the fish are mm -hmm. dying en route and what the likely causes of mortality are. Yeah. So you can tease it apart, but it takes a lot more intensive studies than the ones you were yeah. doing. Yeah. And the, the estimates I provided were just from release to spawning, whereas Art did actually do a survival analysis to look at reach-specific survival, and I have that, have that for the coho as well. I just didn't, didn't get into those numbers today, but they're in the publications. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Hey, ooh, ooh. Oh.